All right. So last show we talked about diabetes. And as you talked about, as we're sitting here chatting about this and prep that, you know, everything is a part of everything, uh, every illness, whatever, it's a part of all the stuff, all the, you know, all the pillars we talk about areas of functional medicine. But as you said, to tease things out, sometimes there, you know, it's a specific issue, a specific manifestation right now, uh, globally, always America's, you know, tends to be the worst, but globally hormones seems to be more and more of a topic. I just looked it up mm. and just like diabetes, man, it's in the news. It's talking about uh, hormone imbalances in women and testosterone in guys and estrogen and blah, 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 blah. So it's this big manifestation if we can call. So that's yeah. what I wanted to look at. And so right off the bat, will you kind of hit on some of the primary symptoms for women, men, and kids? Yeah, hormones. So what a watchword this is in, in our country and globally. And it's kind of funny, you started off with diabetes, which is a hormone imbalance. So yeah. insulin is a hormone. And uh, in fact, it, it, that's a good segue into these other things. If we start off with women and men, a lot of times, and it is, uh, it can be related to our overweightness and sugar content and that kind of thing. But hormones are going to be a part of the equation of unexplained weight gain or why can't I lose this weight? So that's a common one. Fatigue is a common one. Um, stress hormones, cortisol, and we all live in this stressed out world. So cortisol tends to get out of balance and, and that can equal insomnia. We haven't uh, thought about it in that way. So our, our sleep gets disrupted. Um, and then a long list of the more famous hormone related things. So for women, the painful menstrual cycle, the hot flashes through menopause, the sense of, of, of oldness or tiredness. And, and we can stop there and say hormones are kind of the spice of life. So all throughout here, I'll talk about, there's a sense of this. For men, there would be a sense of a loss of strength, a, a sense of softness rather than hardness to the muscles, even to uh, an, um, an erection, a sense of softness versus hardness does have a hormonal connection. To be sure. I was going to say sex drive overall. Sex drive overdraw, overdraw uh, libido. Um, and again, it's not that it just, quote unquote, doesn't turn on. It's a sense of it's not quite right. Yeah. And, and that gets so, and then that gets into your head. And whether the, you're the male or the female, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? And, and then, and of course, your hormones are exactly there responding to your brain. Yeah. Um, so part of it's legit and part, then it gets, you're saying it gets psychosomatic, which is also here. legit. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. I yeah. mean, that's, so it's, 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 it's the one, it's the, it's the spice of life that God's, that God's grace. You also, with. I want to, I want to pull out because it's again, such a growing issue. You talked about fertility in both sides. Yeah. Infertility. So 20% of couples are now in that infertile uh, place. So if you're listening to this and, you know, like a few months ago, we had a young couple in and they might not be thinking about it because they're not so gung ho. But if you've been having unprotected, so no contraception and of course for a year and there's no, there's no conception, that's infertility. Mm -hmm. Well, that's becoming common. And so 20% of people and it's hugely frustrating. And this is not the kind of thing that people post, right? Like, hey, we tried again and nothing happened. And so, you know, it gets hidden. It's painful. It's so, it's frustrating. And people think, gosh, I don't work. And, and mostly women do, but 20, uh, so 40% of the problem is the, is the man. And we'll come back. So, well, let's just segue there. Worldwide testosterone is on a hockey stick of decline worldwide testosterone so in fact that that's an easy google right there if people just google that and uh you know national geographic and other are, are asking the question are we becoming will at this current rate will we become sterile yes the human race will die out right now if nothing changes the level of testosterone we're going to keep going lower to where we cannot procreate good why great question I is the hugely uh, frustrating why situation. And so, like you said at the beginning, everything's related to everything, but we're going to go back to um, what is going on in the physiology of the body. There's, there's, well, I would say the, the foundations. There's not enough 
rest and Sabbath. There's too much stress. We don't give our bodies what it needs. And when it comes to testosterone, as we sort of tease things out, uh, zinc is closely related to that. Chromium, um, the building blocks of all hormones are fats. Well, for the last hundred years, we've been on an anti-fat yeah. campaign. And so all of a sudden, you know, whole two, three generations of people went through their young years eating low fat snack wells, cookies and low fat dressing and whatever Sugar, else. Sugar, not fat. Uh, right. Process, Switched it over process. to that, which is also bad for the hormones. So we don't really know exactly why. Lots of conjecture there. But a nut, so that's, I would say, number one is what are we putting into our bodies? And number two on the input is the toxins. So the concept of neuroendocrine disruptors is very real. And, and this gets uh, controversial into the social media world and people yelling at things on, you know, about Monsanto and glyphosate and those kind of things. But I would say, look, it's not that Germany and France are, are stupid backwoodsy countries. And these countries are not allowing glyphosate, which is Roundup, right? They don't R Roundup, allow which is a, a weed killer. Weed, right. right. And now we have genetically modified Roundup ready foods. You, they don't allow it. And so there's the debate, right? And smart people are, but it's money and politics and all of that stuff. What they can't, now we can debate about how much impact does Roundup have on, you know, my personal testosterone level. And, and that would be a very difficult thing to prove one way or the other, but you can't argue against the fact that worldwide testosterone levels are going down. No doubt. Infertility is going up. We have new toxin levels every day, all the time with new chemicals that aren't put through safety mechanisms. Like we all think that they should be. Uh, there's just too many of them. And then where I get really wrapped up in that is you might isolate a chemical and spend a million dollars and say, look, we've proven that this is not harmful. Great. But what cannot be proven is what about when somebody's a little tired or dehydrated? Is it, is it also unharmful if I have a virus or the combination of all the above? Yeah. That is infinite upon infinite complexity. And we, we so we can't look at you know, the plastic water thing you're drinking out of and say that's proven to be not harmful or, or whatever. So we have to take a step back. And here again, people go, oh my gosh, we'll just throw in the towel and, you know, swing by McDonald's and, and you know, eat, drink and be merry because we're all going to die of a toxin. Every, everything's everything. Oh. Everything's everything. And, and say, no, 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 you can step back and be proactive, be leaning forward into your own stabilities for wellness. I mean, because, okay, so is this, I think I've said this before to some degree, but, you know, here we are doing these uh, things that lead to ill health. You know, we're, things we're not putting into our body, things we are putting into our body, uh, you know, our environment, stress, toxins, relationships. I mean, it's, it's, it's all there. And yet it manifests in these certain channels. Yeah. It happens to manifest into this thing called diabetes. It manifests into this thing called infertility yeah called, infertility yeah. And, and hormone issues no different than it could i'm going to be facetious but it could manifest and all of a sudden there's a rise in people's left eyeballs falling out yeah we don't know why that's the manifestation yeah. but it's just a result of all this stuff so we come back to hormones wait but i do want to hit on infertility because that was one that was so big to me when i first started working with you was how many people we think of infertility and what do you do man you go and you spend zillions on all these treatments yeah. and efforts and drugs and whatever and how many people did you have come in here and you help just address the foundational yeah. issues of their life and boom they got pregnant yeah no but nobody didn't there was not anybody that came in with we think we might be on the infertility side and then it didn't happen if they wanted it to uh so but i don't know how many you know is that five people or 50 um let, let's, let's, we got sidetracked there on the male side, worldwide low testosterone, the toxicants and those kind of things that are going in. What about, so 40% of infertility is male, 40% is female. And 20% is exactly what I was talking about. The male's not quite right. The female's not quite right. And they just keep missing. They don't hit each other at the right, perfect time. And those might be the couples who are like, yeah, for three years, nothing. And then boom, yeah. right there. That's kind of weird. And so- you know, so on the male side, it's not, uh, it's not 
aspermia where there's no sperm, that's, that's pretty rare, but it's oligo, meaning there's fewer sperm per milliliter than, than, than we have seen in the past. There's yeah. just fewer. So they don't have a chance to get to where they want to go. And they are immotile or dismodal. So, you know, they're flipping their little tails along and they're not as strong. They're not as directional. They're not as whatever. So that's what we're seeing. That's the common state. So 40% of male have just improperly functioning sperm whether it's related to fatigue or zinc or this or that or the other or all that stuff. And then over here on the female side, it's more obvious because now we're over here and, and it's the, it's part and parcel going along with maybe if we, we go to the teenagers and somebody, you know, their, their menarche, when they start having a menstrual cycle, it's really sputtery. I like, you know, it hits and fits and spurts and it's very painful and it is either they skip weeks or it's every two weeks. It's just not right in terms of its timing. And if I go 100 feet down the road here to our local high school and I say, how many women in here? So now, you know, 14 to 18. How many women in here have uh, just moody PMS? You know, a few bad days. How many women have acne that gets really worse during your cycle? How many women, um, you get cramping. Enough to take some ibuprofen or maybe you miss a day of school. It's easily 90%. Mm -hmm. Easily. So it's, again, we've commonized it. Women think this is what women do. And I just ache Can, for these. Well, I wanna, so I want to hit a layman's term because as we talk about in, I think every single show that we are in this you know, last 100, 200 years of all these problems and, and these manifestations that did not exist back then. So if we go back to our great grandparents and our great, 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 whatever, and their uh, ladies out in the field, she's out there until the moment she has birth, she may just have birth out there. Now we have this big brouhaha in the hospital and treat it like an emergency, same thing, or in a, in a less acute way, but PMS comes along. I mean, they're, they're out there picking their vegetables. I mean, it's, it wasn't a debilitating issue right that it is today and it's again so and back then the social mores and we don't really know how did our great grandmas talk about their menstrual cycle right i we, we they probably they, they just didn't yeah. talk about it well probably actually they probably did amongst the women amongst themselves the community of women that they had that again women don't have today for and, the most part and that's where we would say well these existed for sure but not in 90 percent yeah and I, I don't know that we know the percentage of those kinds of symptoms without severe diagnoses like endometriosis or something like that well, just, existed. Just back to you normalizing it. It is now it's, normal. You have PMS, you're wrecked. And, you, yeah, you get, and not only that, you're expected to be wrecked. Yeah. And pretty soon these days, I'll, I'll pick on Google because, you know, they let you take naps at work or whatever. Famously, you can do at Google offices. But it's, oh, we'll make an amend for that you know, you get a special room or something like that. Not to say anything it has not, that isn't womanhood. Womanhood does not mean I get wrecked once a month for a few days. It oughtn't mean that it does now. And just like manhood doesn't mean that you should now reach 40 or 50 and you have sexual dysfunction of, of and get time. wrecked. And that now it's the norm. And, and for disclosure, I get asked uh, on the Ziegler show specifically, for advertising for that a lot. And it, no reason I shouldn't other than, you know, it's kind of a sensitive topic. I got a conservative audience, so I, I don't do that. But what speaks to me is that I keep getting asked that, that people are advertising for it because it is in a growing demand back to your, you know, testosterone yeah. uh, issue that's or decrease that's happening. And people are having to now take a drug to try to address it's this a, issue that should not be normal. That should not be normal. That's, that's right. We have normalized it and, and back to, I mean, you have um, women, children in your home, and I grew up with sisters. I don't have any women, children, and it was a theme. And we, you know, we were gentle, and and that's what I'm teaching my boys is you, this is like the height of respect to a woman is understanding how physiology really does work. They're special. This is fertility. This is part of the human condition it requires this this monthly menstrual cycle happens for 40 50 years and you might give birth you know two three four whatever times or or not at all or whatever but it is it's special and now it's become a burden 
women, how many times, and then we, if we go to menopausal time period, and they're like, oh my gosh, can I just be done? How about we use some surgical techniques? I don't need these organs anymore. Yeah. And, and so, and there's consequences to that. It's not that you're born with a super efficiency of an ovary or, and so if we, if we're going along our list, so that's the young women with, with acne and, and painful breasts and, and the, the painful menstrual cycle. And it's very common. Um, well, more, more, I feel like even in the time that I've been with you, that it's more and more, uh, well, everything, you know, the symptoms are getting in younger and younger people, but yeah, that, that we're now, you're mm -hmm. not over here just treating hormone stuff in 50 year old and plus women, you're oh, dealing no. with a 15 year old girl. Yes. And 25, 35, 45, 55, because yeah. for women, for men, it's not, you know, it's acne in, in the teen years is not normal. So there again, you know, teenagers doesn't equal acne in every person on every planet. All well, the time. Me, so I've got right now in my house, I have three boys of uh, over the age of 14. One of them has Ian, he, he, he's acne. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's it. The others don't. Don't never have it. It'd be boom. It's him. So that's a great analogy. So here's a, a family where they're eating the same They're, I mean, he's not a stressed out kid. He's just chill and whatever. So very similar. And yet that's his gig. He's got. Okay. Acne. And that's fair. We could say, do hormones have an impact on young person's acne? And the answer is clearly, clearly it does, but it's not causal. You can't look at a kid with acne and go, Oh, hormones. I, I mean, that's just so incredibly obtundant. Well, he's the one who also had asthmatic stuff as a kid. He was always a yeah. little more prone. So he's, just like you, you've got a kid who's, who's going to get something. If, yeah. if something is going to happen, he's There's some propensity. Right. Uh, deficit, and, and you've whatever. got a, another kid when it comes to the sugar that if she's going to be exposed yeah. to that, she's going to get the, the thing. Yeah. Ian won't. I mean, he's going to eat, you know, a gallon of ice cream a day for years before. <laughs> it's not helping his acne. <laughs> That's probably not helping his acne. <laughs> but, but, there, but that, I, I do want to, you know, as you said, tease that out to where yeah. we are saying that, okay, let's take, if we take everybody, if you take uh, 10 patients, 10 men, 10 women, all the same symptoms, and you help undergird and strengthen the overall, the functional yeah, medicine, yeah, the basics. you do that, uh -huh. that you're going to have a couple of them that still have x issue yeah. and you're going to go you know what you might be well served for a literal hormone treatment and you prescribe it yeah and that's where well and we test it so that's uh, we're going to do the we're going to do the lab work right. Right. right and and that so and that's where i would say the biomarkers are helpful the and the guy's going to be low in what other what other for the guy just low in testosterone boom there it is you looked at our scores recently yeah, didn't you uh, yeah and so the other hormones that people aren't going to know about the DHEA the DHT the uh, the cortisol uh, for women you know progesterone and estrogen and so we actually test estradiol the main estrogen in men yeah. because in men you especially don't if you're overweight any, don't we have absolutely in fact there was one I had a man the other day and I'm, and he was getting one of these uh, injections. And I said, dude, you've got as much, you've got more estrogen than a lot of women. So you're going to feel different. And we have <laughs> women with increasing testosterone. Did you say uh, that? No, they, so, well, because I mean, they are supposed to have a level. Yeah, they do. And actually more women are going to have low testosterone on, on that side. Oh. Right. So, uh, it's a great, great topic. Uh, well, it, it just to hit on that, and, you know, because we'll get in. Well, we need to get into foods. I don't know if you want to now or not, but we hear with estrogen how many people, especially the health conscious ones, have heard, "Don't eat soy. It's got well, estrogen in it. Yeah, it's got to increase your, or it's got to increase it, or whatever." Is that? Yeah, there. That's that's back up a little bit and say we are in a society of what is happening is estrogen dominance that our diets and lifestyles tend to create the kind of physiology that's really good on the estrogen side and really not good on the progesterone side. So it's not fair to say, oh, soy is the problem here. It's we live a, a life that tends to what I just said. So we live in an estrogen dominant place and that estrogen dominance tends to mean more acne, more irritability, more fatigue, uh, more, uh, irregular menstrual cycles, the painful kind of things. And, and, and then in the end result of that would be endometriosis where the estrogen uh, 
cells, production cells are now outside of the ovary and they're inside of the pelvic cavity and, and it creates pelvic pain, abdominal pain. Can we talk about food for a second? Uh, yeah. We so, have- well, okay, I'll go towards food. That What are the big pushers down that estrogen dominant pathway? Clearly, food is one of them, if not the big, biggest one, but it's not soy. Well, but that's, that's the only one I've ever heard of. And that sugar. Okay. Sugar. I'll okay. say it again. Carbs is the big push down that pathway. Now, also in that are going to be, so soy is a great food. There's a lot of health. I mean, when we were little, tofu and soy, that was a health food. I was going to ask, do you eat much? Because I don't I'd think you say do. tofu, yeah. I never, see no. you, I never see you eat soy. Well, products. I'll get that at the, at when we do Chinese. Do you? Okay. Uh-huh. On, and I'm not doing sushi, so it's usually a dinner. We don't, not because we got scared of it. But I just, no, I, I, I love, but I, I would say here again, Soy is one of the most genetically modified foods. Well, I was going to say, so you go to, you get somebody who's going to go vegetarian, vegan, or gluten-free or whatever, and, or dairy-free. And all of a sudden, I mean, that's the, in this, in the, uh, heck the grocery stores, I mean, soy is like the number one non, you know, dairy alternative, non whatever. And you can, you can pack yourself. I mean, when I first went vegan, right. Soy is high. 19 years old. Oh my gosh, we ate soy everything. Right, and I wouldn't do that because you're trying to do all this fake stuff. I'll never forget (laughs) one soy burgers. Yeah, telling the guy, you know, talking to the guy about you know soy flavor, you make it taste like bacon. It's all sorry. He says, dude, if I want bacon, I'm gonna eat bacon. (laughs) If I'm not going to, I'm not going to, and I'm not gonna eat this processed stuff. Right. So I do appreciate that. Yeah, we got to watch out with the soy because it is so highly processed, and we we actually don't probably because we have been skewed by the estrogen, whatever. So. Like with milk stuff, we get coconut or almond or. So I, I think that's that's very fair to say. If you stay out of the soy processing, and all these fake milks are processed something. Yeah. So that's, uh, but but probably right. The soy milk, rice milk, I, I wouldn't choose because there's better alternatives if you have to be dairy free. But if if you look at soybean, I mean, I love edamame, oh, but yeah. I would get organic, and non GMO. And that's, 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 you got to look for that in America. And I wouldn't do it like, oh yeah, we have edamame every night. That's, that's, we talked about that many times, but edamame. So what is the basic food of soy would be edamame and tofu, which is fermented edamame. Mm -hmm. And of course, these are, these are legumes, the beans. I want to pull on that because it's a temptation for our family is the uh, fake meat things, you know? Oh yeah. Now we have the big ones, the not... Oh, uh, impossible. The, burger. Yeah, yeah. And for us, it was just Boca burgers and you can get Boca burger, you know, chicken patties. It was, you can get, you know, beef, chicken, whatever substitutes, you know, no, yeah. no meat, no gluten, whatever. And man, hi. So for us, we do that occasion. We have burger night and you're doing grass fed beef, which is probably, I'm sure it is better. And we're I'm doing, argue it's better. We're doing, <laughs> we're doing these processed, you know, fake patties and stuff. The kids love, it. but we do treat it as a treat. I mean, it is sure. a, it is a, it is a, an absolute treat. We don't look at it as a health food, but we do it because some of the kids don't eat meat, don't want to eat meat. So we, uh, and, and, and this impossible burger stuff. So it, it's still beans. It's still legumes that they're using, but it's less soy and more another pea. It's but again, pea-based mass, protein. massively Massive processed. produced. Yeah. But I would say it is better than the actual burger patty over at wherever, you know, Burger King or McDonald's or whatever. And, and that'll be conjecture. And I, well, I, yeah, we don't know. Okay. Okay. But talk I, I about was, hormones. I mean, that is a, again, anybody yes, in the health, uh, who's gone to the health direction yes. has heard about the hormones in yes. the meat, meat products, yes. eggs, beef. I'll chicken. agree with you there. Yeah. And that's where, uh, I, I, and I feel sorry for people, for us, because to buy your foods with this awareness, hormone free, organic in these kind of words. Yes, it's more expensive. Way more. Well, it's, it's but, just frustrating. But again, I'm going to point, so we don't eat. And we eat less of it. Yeah. We, uh, we get uh, fish, but we get wild caught, which is, which is uh, more expensive too. More expensive. And sometimes it's hard to believe, but you are, uh, you guys eat what? Beef, chicken. Yeah. And you, but, but you buy grass fed here in yeah. town. A lot of times you go in with people to buy a grass fed yeah. locally slaughtered. Yeah. Yeah quarter, half, whatever, and, and find the right people. And that's why I say it's really great if you can know your farmer. Okay. Is it fair to say, cause again, being in the health world, you read about things of, 
oh my gosh, we have, you know, a culture of girls, especially in certain demographics, certain areas of the world or whatever that are hitting puberty. Er this is one we hit hitting yes. puberty early and they're trying to, they're citing it to some degree, the amount of hormones in their food that they're eating. Yeah. I would say there's no doubt that that, well, okay, that's debatable. Right, this is huge data. But if you but look at stats, and go, gosh, yeah, we have clearly we're having. You know, if the average age now is is eleven, twelve, it was thirteen, fourteen in the past, and there's no doubt about that. So puberty in women tends to, well, and in men might even tend to go the other way, because there again, it's you know we're estrogen dominant. It's starting the process sooner. Men are. I don't know the stats on puberty and boys, if that's, if that's moving to the other side uh, or starting later, but they're, they're starting earlier and they're starting painfully. Like, and it's, it, it, it's this thing. And is it related to the hormones in our foods? Yes. And dairy is the other one, milk and, yeah. and, you know, that kind of hormone. And these are the neuroendocrine disruptors. That's they're in cosmetics. They're in so much of our, processing of our life to try to make things easier and cheaper and which is good right we all want to make available easier and cheaper and and well looking at food again we come back to the industrial revolution and we all know or we all know a lot most people I, th I think know you know we've got cattle who used to be as you said grass-fed so it's the cow that's out on your grandpa's field it's eaten uh, grass and natural stuff and then at some point you, you kill it and eat its meat and now we put them in these industrial uh, manufacturing. Yeah, they're called CAFOs, so concentrated animal feeding operations. Okay. Where which we we drive yeah. by them, so when we're oh, going to Texas, terrible. the back roads, you yeah. go by the slaughterhouse, and it does not smell like an animal. It smells like chemicals, like a chemical vat yeah. gone sour, gone horrifically. I mean, it's the kids gag, yeah. and it's not because they don't eat a lot of meat. It's because anybody would gag. It's dis it's disgusting. But that's what we eat in the amount of chemicals going into those animals and then over here we are with the american dairy council you know it does a body good and we generally have dairy for every i grew up every single meal right. you had a glass of milk <laughs> you had cheese on your uh, you know with your food or in your food what other dairy that's amazing. butter yogurt mm -hmm. butter mm -hmm. yeah and those and if we go back 150 years and and it, you had a glass of milk you had butter and it came from your cow in the backyard and i would say it's probably was really good Oh my gosh. I, no, I remember it. I went to my grandparents' house and, and they it got real. it off the Amish farm. And it was, I mean, the creams at the top, they'd stir it up and you have it. It tastes like a milkshake. It was incredible. So with industrialization or, or even, you know, even it's post-World War II. So pre-World War II, still 70% of America was agrarian wow. out on the fields, right? We think of big towns existed back then and they did, but 70% was agrarian. And then that transition to where now what, two or 3%? is is out there and it's all this massive industrialized if you pull the curtain back on the the use of animals to produce food it's it's cruel it's disgusting um and even when we go when it's we buy our it's inefficient our it's oh and like uh dr hyman said it's also the chief contributor to the warming effect yeah. to our our climate crisis if we have as you know as we are warming uh, the the food production system of of our world is the chief contributor not cars not the industrialized mechanized whatever else of, of producing a computer but of producing our food and and so how do we come away from and, that and if, if folks if you hear that and want to hear more about it if mark hyman h-y-m-a-n dr mark hyman the book is called food fix yeah, and he's got a huge podcast called uh, Something Farm. Pharmacy with F A R M F A R M A C Y. If you type in Hyman Pharmacy, you'll find it. But the bubble up, the, the the ability to do that kind of let's go back to the animals to be able to do that in mass production where we are overeating those hormones is a big part. How much does that play into our hormone? It's got to be a lot. So a lot of factors into why our hormones messed up. I don't know, but they are. Right. And there's Mrs. Smith who says, yeah, I had tough menstrual cycles as a kid, you know, and then they'll have babies from 25 to 35 and they'll say, well, I, I, you know, pregnancy weight, I lost it. I gained it. A lot of women will say, oh, I, f I finally felt normal when I got pregnant and other women are wrecked when they get pregnant. Yeah. And then oh, gosh, a lot of the uh, post 
post, post postpartum depression right. and the postpartum. So, so there again, when we're working with the infertility couples, they, they generally conceive. And if you're working with postpartum depression, they fear, oh my gosh, I want to have another kid. We're planning on this, but I'm just so incredibly. And so of the 10 or so of those, they, they don't, you know, they generally have a better course of, of whatever. When we address hormones and of course that's going to be related to insulin thyroid cortisol all of these hormones not not just the sex hormones so what are the literal treatments let's just go on let's start with women so if you when you have one you say gosh i think let's try based on your, your labs and i'm seeing this let's try a hormone therapy there's yeah topicals, let's, let's there's- do that but let's add one more category of menopause so the other famous you know, the start of a menstrual cycle, the ending of a menstrual cycle, those are the highlights of, of very obvious sex hormone changes. And so now normally in America, and I probably say these words, you know, 20 times a day, that uh, f- for women in the average age is around 51, and they expect to experience negative things. Menopause mm-hmm. itself is a negative word. Mm-hmm. Very interestingly, when we were stationed in Japan, I learned that the word menopause is an honorific. Hmm. It's like saying, yes, ma'am. I thought that was very interesting. So in America, it's like, oh, we're going to push that off and fake like we don't have menopause because menopause means old, dry, hot flash, vaginal dryness, poor libido changes. And the only, the word means change from childbearing, not childbearing. That's, that's what the word means is just change. So your hormones don't cease and go to zero. They shouldn't. Now, we don't know what they should go to, and so we measure them, and we are looking for what are the better labs for this kind of a person. But hot flash, vaginal dryness, poor libido, and brain. And, you know, did you lose your brain with, with menopause? Did you lose your personality? Did you lose your memory? Did you lose your concentration? Or not lose, did it change? Was menopause evidence of a significant brain thinking personality thing and there's going to be husbands out there going uh yeah that's that's you you know elbow to the wife over here and andropause does exist too it's just not as obvious in the man and andropause so the the lowering of testosterone and the changing of those kind of hormones and so that might be happening in the uh or you know in the 40s all the way to the 80s and it's much more gray debatable should it happen at all, or is it another consequence of our say, modern you go lifestyle? Into the Asian culture, and forgive me for speaking, to, I'm not that, but when you talk about they treated menopause as a positive in that sense, for the man, I know that the virility in the old age was held up as high, high esteem. That was a big deal. You know, that's important. virility, manliness, and all of that. So, there again, we live in a culture where to lose virility is that that's that's a bad thing Mm -hmm. that's part of why women i don't really want to either i mean but viral means able to reproduce i don't want to do that anymore (laughs) so i I happen to know i I happen to know that you (laughs) are (laughs) infertile um right so but a woman doesn't have a choice Mm -hmm. she becomes infertile and when we are if, if we talk about the sex hormones and youngness, you know, youthfulness. That's, that's part of youthfulness, yeah. certainly. And a woman doesn't have a choice. At 50, it gets ripped out from under. And so culturally, we also live in, a, in this place where it's been this patronistic, patronizing doctor who's usually a white male who says, oh, honey, we can just take care of that. And they'll surgerize it, meaning take those organs out. Or it's, here's a medicine. So from the 70s on, uh, the famous Premarin and Provera kinds of things were used. And then also famously, and I'm mentioning this because most women who are in their 50s now have parents who went through this. And so we are still in it where, oh my gosh, if I take hormones, I'm going to get cancer. I'm going to die. Taking hormones is bad. And, And that's not necessarily true. Again, too many hormones is bad, too few hormones is bad. There's symptoms on both sides of this, but in 2000, right around 1999, the Women's Health Study says, oh my gosh, for the last 30 or 40 years, we've been killing women. 
by giving them these hormones, we're going to yank all these hormones away from women. It's now, no, you don't get to have. And so horrific hot flash, horrific problems for those who are on treatment and confusion. So we are now 15 plus years later and still in significant confusion. So on the menopausal side, that's where you are angling towards treatment. And that's what I wanted to present that. And because most people who get treatment are going to be over there in that area. Okay. Yes. Though you have younger women who you've. True. On now younger women and treatment tends to mean, oh my gosh, my, my periods are so bad. And it's almost a badge of honor that I notice in the young people is like, I'm on birth control. My symptoms are so bad. I'm on birth control. Well, birth control isn't a health pill, right? It doesn't make you healthy. And there's, there's, there's issues. It almost always will reduce your amount of B well, complex it go, vitamins. It go back to you just saying that it's, that it's now it's normal. Well, it wasn't so many years ago that uh, you weren't on birth control. Well, birth control didn't exist didn't at exist. some point. It was abstinence. Um, but then getting to that point of it was created to control birth. And now it's this thing that most every girl is supposed to get to help her uh, wellness. And yeah, to go back and go, why do we have, well, did God make us with a deficit of birth control, whatever's in there? <laughs> That's, and, and there, I, I, I don't want to imply that it's most girls that it seems like the norm. It's, just, it's, it's so much more common than it was. Or is that just, uh. and, and, and here, and of course, my wife works with these young women. And I just ache for the family practice docs who are seeing many, many people per day. And then here comes a young, vulnerable 14, 15, 16 year old girl who just hurts. Okay. I was going to, I was about to say this and I was going to not, but why not? It's our show. We can, people hear it and don't like us. Don't listen. How, how often, how much is the propensity to prescribe birth control for a health reason, a PMS reason, but it's also to help uh, control, control birth. birth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, so it's a good excuse to give them birth control so that they can have sex and not get pregnant. Yeah. It's it, got a factor. In. I, I, and you know, for, for that, and you know, we have teenagers and teaching my young men to respect her so much that there's a protection there that, 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 that there's an honor there. And then when, if you can't, it changes the psyche. Even if somebody has pure, noble intentions and all of that, but there's, oh, I'm on birth control. Safeguard. <sighs> it's safe, I mean, it's, like well, it. okay, yeah, at least that won't happen. So yeah. it absolutely changes. I've, every single, and it, so with my wife working with in a crisis pregnancy center, and so these unexpected pregnancies happen, and it's an unintended um, situation. And so often a, a girl will even say, well, my mom just put me on birth control. I didn't even really understand. Mm -hmm. And, or it was, yeah, the, the symptoms were so bad. We just went ahead and started that, but did it play into her decision or lack of awareness or something? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It, it, of course it does. So, so here we are and it's become this very common thing and, and people take it for health reasons. But again, back to the family practice doc, it takes time to, really get into that young girl's heart and say, you know, be aware there's all of these other issues going on. Um, and, and, and our medical system just doesn't do that, right? We don't have the time to do that. So, so, so there's the therapy on that young side. If I'm working with somebody who is in that frustrating place, then we start at different places. We start where we have started in the past with uh, what's your nutrition, of course. And, and for young women, the stress factor of trying to do grades, they get up at gosh awful early, they go to bed gosh awful late, that they don't get enough sleep. And I look at it, I say, why wouldn't your body be under stress? And it, and it, the right. hormone cycle is so special, it's dainty. I was, okay, right there. I, back to infertility. I was going to mention this earlier. I have heard a good number of stories, enough that obviously sticks in my mind, of the person, and, and I think a lot of people have heard that the person, a uh, couple, they went along, they could not conceive, and they went and they did this, they did that, couldn't conceive. Finally, they decided, you know what, we're just going to go the adoption route. They go, they adopt a kid, and boom, get pregnant. 
where's the psychosis? Right. Psych- they, not psychosis, they relax. Psychology. So they, yeah. They, I, well, you going back to it. So what did you say? Uh, not, not s- s- fragile or fr- dainty. It's dainty. fragile. We take it for granted. Yeah. This, I mean, imagine it just starts, you know, you're 12 years old and yeah. it just starts. And then for 40 years, it just goes every 28 ish days. And there's this cycle and we, pound on it with lack of sleep and too much stress and sugar, sugar, sugar. I'm insulin, thinking, of, insulin, I'm thinking about that couple that's going along. How many of those couples, and of course I'm just theorizing here are going on and it's their stress about the conception alone. Oh yeah. That is screwing up and, that daintiness. And but we have it. to say to those people, think of the psychology that you just put them into. You're, you're just yelling at them. Stop being so stressed out about being stressed out. Well, yeah. <laughs> And so well, everybody can go figure out well, why is it? That would be the question. Why is it that we have this percentage of people that cannot conceive and within a short period of time yeah. after adopting, they can see sure. uh, it, it's so, and that's where I, I, again, not to say that, Oh my gosh, we're, we're just in a losing situation. Know that if we elevate the foundational truths of life of nutrition and exercise and sleep and all of the, all of those kind of things, then the hormones just kind of happen. So I like to think of that in our culture, especially the sex hormones. So we are in a sex driven culture yeah. and, and, and those Viagra commercials aren't married couples. Well, okay. I take that back. Some of them are never mind. Never mind. We're in a sex driven commercial uh, culture. world culture. So, but in reality, sex happens like we use the word turn on like the libido Mm -hmm. happens when things are just right and that's much more dainty in a woman so along comes Mm -hmm. stressful days busy kids uh those kind of things and it won't quote unquote turn on it's just like man we had a great date night we had everything but it just it won't click whatever however we say those words right because that's that's the spice of life. That's the icing on the cake. That's the tail of the dog. Going back to the normal, it's expectation, especially in a woman, that it's just going to decrease. That's just the norm. As you get older, it is. For not, notwithstanding menopause, yep. where and people say, "Well, what do you expect? Yeah. You know, you're 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 older. You're tired. This is what happens, and you're probably depressed." So down they go, the medication pathway of antidepressants or things like that, which is not wrong, but it isn't getting to the we have to flip it around our culture. It's the tail wagging the dog, right? Sex sells. So everything gets pointed that way. And if sex doesn't work, well, you are broken, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, Oh my gosh. And flip it around. If the dog, if we're taking care of the main part of the situation, the tail tends to follow instead of the tail trying to wag the dog. Yeah. So that to me is also for these couples. So refreshing. We say, Hey, look, You're in it. So job number one is to say, we're going to restart the clock right now. We're just going to restart the clock. So you're just going to have to agree to agree. I know you're feeling the pressure, but it's another year. And that's the definition. So, so as we're working on these things, I'm going to give you all these things to do and to think about and whatever else, but just, just let yourself restart the clock, you know, put it a year out there. And if this hasn't happened in a year, then you know what? It's a better you're going to have a better chance of success with IVF and these other things. That, that is a great statement for the fertility aspect. That is you support the overall foundation with all this functional medicine, uh, you know, tenants that we talk about here in the show that even if you then still need to go, you're a better candidate Do the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the other treatments mm-hmm. better chance that it's going to take. Okay. I want to take that and come back again to, you know, somebody, uh, people doing the right things. And then some of them do have enough brokenness in this area that you do prescribe. What, what do you, what is a literal, cause there's different, uh, right. So treatments, men and women. So on the, so if we think through the young woman's eyes, then we will add, and this is over the counter. You can buy over the counter progesterone. So as you're trying to live the kind of life that's toning down the fuel for estrogen, right? You want, we want to balance the estrogen progesterone. And so we might put in a topical progesterone cream and that can be an over the counter one. And you just want to get one. That's, that's really good. Topical. I didn't know that. So over the counter topical Topical progesterone progesterone cream for for a girl, woman, for a woman. 
<laughs> remember that one time I, in our, uh, I put an estrogen cream in for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> put it on a list of prescribed. <laughs> I was going to, you know, I'm a trusty oh, yeah, guy. Yeah, that's a good and, one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, so back to the young woman, we, and we would say, hey, this is a nudge. It's a help. For young women outside of when we do have to use uh, the, the birth control, um, there, there isn't, for young people and certainly for a young man, we're not going to do testosterone. We're not going to do, there's no medications that, um, if, outside of the extreme, like there's going to be the, the you know, one in a million kind of a thing. But for the general people that we're looking at, it is get your lifestyle going. But for the young women, hey, if you add in the progesterone, there's a chance that that can help. There's a whole lot of supplements out there that we sort of fiddle around with. Sure, but I, I do want to hit into the, you know, I mean, right now, so right now here in the practice, with however many patients mm -hmm. that you have, a number or a percentage, I know you're going to say, I, I assume that it's, it's few, but you do have some women that are taking a, what, a topical cream? Topical cream, uh-huh. Which is a prescribed, it you know, comes from the compounding pharmacy. Right, so let's go over to menopause. So now you're on to the menopausal side of things. Well, don't you started with girls, you know, the few that right. we need. So, so the, the over-the-counter creams, the lower doses. Yeah, but I mean, but pre-menopause, so the women that aren't even there, that sometimes you are prescribing something to before we even get the menopause is what if their labs are low enough yeah then yeah so then we can use estradiol okay. and progesterone and testosterone as medicines pill form topical both so so in this area it's very important that you do get with a trusted clinician because the testing is hard do we use salivary urine blood testing and that's kind of controversial, debatable. <clears throat> what are you? What's your main? So I usually use the blood because it is easier and cheaper. And we can run it through insurance a lot of the times. But I suspect that the most accurate is going to be the urine side of things. Mm -hmm. So a great testing company that's out there is called Dutch. stands for Dried Urine Total Complete Hormone. So they have a lot of educational videos. Um, Dutch testing. And um, there are lots of books. And so this is an area to, to understand and know and read about. And it is controversial. So there isn't a clear, exactly right pathway to urine or blood or whatever. So I, I tell women all the time, look, <clears throat> this is mostly going to be about our conversations. How do you feel? And if you say, oh, I feel terrible, but you also aren't doing nutrition, exercise, sleep, it's like, well, let's we're still going to have to start there because you want to be, again, this is fine tuning. Well, well, but I appreciate, I want to pull that out again, that generally, well, or always, you are not going to go prescribe a pharmaceutical medication until somebody until, has done the well, other things. Right. It, to me, that would be malpractice. Yeah. It's like a high blood pressure. Do you have any patients right now on high blood pressure? You probably do. Well, yeah, sure. But, okay. but if you got the guy that comes in, you had this, I'll never forget the guy. He said, you know what? I just, I would rather just take my pill and eat what I want. Yeah. And, and he said, I, I'm just going to eat a steak and I'm going to take Liptor. <laughs> and, and, he, and that was when you ch change over to a cash pay practice and he did not remain there. So you're only going to be prescribing to those people who have done, who are doing their homework otherwise. Sure. And wouldn't all the people out there say, gosh, yeah, that's how I also raise my kids. I'm not going to clean their room for them. I might help my three-year-old as I'm teaching him how to do that. But by the time he's 13, it's just get the thing done. Mm -hmm. You know, there's or, not a or, pill or for that. More acutely wiping butts at some point. Hopefully nobody's <laughs> okay. out there with a 10-year-old yeah. who's, who's, mommy, I'm done now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a point where you go, okay, buddy, it's up to you. Okay. So granted, uh, so anyway, but back well, to those. So there's some right. So we just went all facetious there, and it is, it is complex. And this is where I'd say the expertise of a physician or a clinician who's, you know, working in that world. And I know that we are the limiting factor. There's not a lot of functional medicine docs out there. Yeah. That's the most common question we get. Is you know, well, I live over here. Where can I find a doc like that? So, so the encouragement then is to educate yourself, and understand that you're, you're not having a deficiency of a, a medication. If you give your body what it needs, it, it does want to get better. But sometimes, like you say, it just, we're too far gone. 
whatever. I mean, you've had some guys that are relatively healthy, active guys that were low in testosterone sure. and you prescribed, uh, and again, there's topical, there's a pill, there's. Yep. Um, and it. so we'll use any number of ways The probably the most effective is injection. So people don't okay. like that, right. you know, but, but that uh, is it. That has to come from a, that's going to be a, from a doc. And, with and what do you do with all the guys? How do the guys get it that are out there? They're just doing it. I was just going to say muscle. it's controlled because of those guys. Those guys are cheating. How do they get it? Well, on the street. Really? Yeah. You're asking. I don't know. <laughs> I, I've always wondered. That. I like, sell them out the back <laughs> out the back door, man. Uh, but like, yeah, the bodybuilder guys are out there. There's no problem, but they're just wanting to bulk up. But are they getting a doctor to prescribe it, or it's literally out there? On, I didn't know. I, I really don't. I've never know. heard of that. That somebody got busted in an alley for selling testosterone. All right. Yeah, that's the whole Lance Armstrong. You know, the the video. Sure of these, a, well, he did have a doc that was hooking him up. Apparently. Yeah. Anyway, okay. yeah, right. I'm glad to say you and I do not know how to procure <laughs> illegal. No, but if anybody's interested, I'll see if I can find some. Well, I, yeah. So, so for the guys, you know, and there for the guys we measure, well, for the women too, we're, we're doing the blood work. And if you've got a, a testosterone level of, you know, 100 and you have ta low testosterone symptoms, you know, low libido, I can't gain weight, or I can't build muscle, then I'm going to say, well, Let's work on all these other things. But if we give you the medicine, you're going to feel better. Faster. And talk about the thing uh, that was uh, used my labs where I was producing enough testosterone, like I'm at a healthy level, but I wasn't assimilating it. I had never heard that. Of, yeah. So I looking at the whole. And so this is where this is the steroidogenic pathway. So if you want to Google something and you look at the steroidogenic pathway, like how does Kevin Miller wind up with testosterone? Well, your pathway is just like mine. It's just like your wife's. It's the same pathway, but going from one chemical to the next is enzymatically controlled. So now into your genetics and how does your genetics set things up and you're a male. So it produces a different way than, than a woman does, but it's the same pathway. And right at the top of that pathway is cholesterol. So here again, you and I grew up in the eighties with low fat, low cholesterol for 30, whatever years. And is that going to impact our andropause as we hit those years? And I would say, well, yeah, probably, you know, and, and here we are. So, um, so it starts off with cholesterol, which is a kind of a fat and then pregnenolone and then progesterone. And then there's kind of a dividing line right there where, and that's where I would go to me and you that your body is right now making a decision because you just ate. Well, you ate like three days ago. <laughs> so good job. Thanks. So what you ate three days ago, your body is still, well, you're consuming stored fat right now. And your body is deciding right now and right now and right now, are we going to take this resource of a, of a stored cholesterol and we're going to break it down and we're going to go down this pathway or down this pathway. And so that dividing line is cortisol to DHEA, cortisol being the stress hormone. So for if, if our hormones are on the low side and, and, and we looked at mine and mine was lower than it was, and I'd say, the biggest factor there would be a stress response yeah. over time. And then your, and, and your body also gets into a habit. It tends to do what it has been doing. So if you live in that stress world and the hormone imbalance of too much cortisol and, and is pulling resources away down a stress response and it doesn't go over there, the next one is DHEA, which leads to testosterone and estrogen. Well, sure, there's less of a sexual response. And that makes sense. I'm stressed out you know, things don't turn on. So, so if we go back over to the DHEA and that's what we had measured in you, uh, was to say, well, what's the DHEA level? And then DHT comes after that. So we can measure all of those things and kind of see where, where does the imbalance seem to be happening? Where do we try to change your behavior? Where might we inject a supplement or a, a, a therapy? So if you're, I mean, so again, overall, obviously, the primary message in this show and, and all of them are taking care of the body overall is your best method methodology for dealing, making sure your hormones are where they need to be. If, however, you feel like you're doing those things and you do, or you are struggling with sex drive, with PMS, with fatigue, all these things, yep. this could be an area to specifically address. And that is when even you have those times of going, okay, we are going to supplement 
mm -hmm. with something that wish we didn't need need to right. use, but in this case, Let's it might be relevant. Use a tool. And in contrast to some of our other shows, this is also a place where you need a doc. Yeah. Well, the, you can go get your labs, but this is such a difficult interpretation. And we've talked about those lab companies uh, where you can go and pay for your own hormone labs. Yeah. It's pricey. And then you're going to pay another priciness if you want a doctor consultation through those companies. I don't know how they do that. Um, and even in that sense, it's not cut and dried. And it never will be. So don't think that, and, and we tell people all the time as we're starting this, look, this is, a, this is squishy science. This is really fuzzy science. Uh, we, we can measure levels precisely, but it doesn't, we can have a guy with a testosterone of 100. He's got no ED. He's got perfect libido. He's building muscle. He's going to the gym every day. And, and you know, why would I mess with his testosterone? And another guy with, you know, 800 and he's got all these symptoms. So, so this is a difficult one and I encourage people to, you know, learn about it if they need to. Uh, it's, it's, it's emotional, it's frustrating, it's fuzzy. And so always trust the foundation that we've talked about before. That's always going to be helpful. Um, and try to lean into finding a doc that, that can help you. And then depending upon what the what the landing point is. If you're down the infertility pathway or down one, any of these other pathways, you know, that's going to be that pain, that perception is going to be some of your motivation mm -hmm. to, to address these issues. Right. That was good. I, I